Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 11. I need another hand here. Today we're going to talk about white bags around mortar shells. What are they for? Ukrainians using or not using shotguns to clear trenches. Why missiles aren't sanitized when they're fired, meaning why aren't all the data plates taken off of the missile. NATO's communication languages, whether training is perishable, and universal NATO gear. A couple of things before we get started. Uh, if you want to support the channel, buy a personalized cameo greeting for dad this year for Father's Day. Get a t-shirt from Bunker Branding, like my Department of the Boat People shirt, or join my Substack to see uncensored footage and analysis. I'm trying some tricks to give you better audio. I can't have a microphone in front of me because I'm half Italian and I talk with my hands, so hopefully this green screen setup will cut down on the echo a little bit. Let's get started. Lisa asks, can you please explain what those whitish looking rings above the fins around a mortar do looks like for distance uh, or who knows? Well, Lisa, you're right. Those whitish rings are called increments or charges. I did a short video about this a while back, but shorts are like fireworks. They fall out of consciousness quickly. So here it is to answer your question. What are the white bags tied around mortar rounds in Ukraine? Both Russian and Ukrainian. Mortar systems share this characteristic because they both use Soviet era equipment. The white bags are charges. Basically bags of propellant. The more charges that you tie to the mortar round, the further the shell will travel. And on a 120 millimeter mortar, you can have up to six. The holes in the bottom of the stabilizer tube are called flash holes. Here's how it works. The shell is dropped into the mortar. The shell falls down the tube and hits a pin, which detonates a primary cartridge explosive although sometimes a lanyard is used to trigger the pin. The explosion travels up through the flash holes, detonating the propellant and pushing the mortar round out of the tube through gas and sending it on its way to the target. When a unit receives a box of shells, the charges are included and have to be tied around the stabilization tubes manually. NATO systems are a little different. They come in prepackaged cardboard containers with the charges already on the round. So you just pull off the charges that you don't need in order for the shell to travel to the required range. Yako asks, I wonder why shotguns aren't used more often in the Ukraine conflict as compared to World War I. I'm guessing everyone has automatic rifles and maybe it's not needed. So a shotgun is essentially a farm tool pressed into service as a weapon. You can't argue with a fox. You can't tell the fox to go to Whole Foods and maybe consider vegan options. The problem with shotguns in combat is that modern body armor will just will shrug it off. Uh, back in World War I, uh, and even up to Iraq and Afghanistan, a shotgun would be very decisive at close range. You, you don't shoot somebody with a shotgun, you disassemble somebody with a shotgun. But modern body armor has kind of negated that. And what we're seeing in this LISCO or uh, large scale combat operations or uh, operations against a near peer adversary, we're seeing most people have body armor. And a shotgun versus body armor just isn't going to work. So against a near peer adversary, you need a rifle. Okay, J.E. Funk asks, why are the identification plates not removed prior to firing a missile, drone, or military equipment that is not expected to return? Example, storm shadow debris had ID plates. So the storm shadow missile is a cruise missile that was developed by this Anglo-French consortium. Uh, I think it was BAE, Leonardo, and Airbus. And supposedly this weapon was given to Ukraine, although it weighs like 3,000 pounds, and I think only the, the Su-24 can fire it. Uh, it's, it's that heavy. This weapon supposedly showed up at a target in Russia, and supposedly there are pictures of data plates in the debris. Now the question is, why don't manufacturers remove the data plates from these weapons? So manufacturing a weapon system, is, it's made up of multiple subcontractors, and it would be re impossible to remove all of the serial numbers and data plates for every subcontractor. Uh, if you look at a Honda Civic, a Honda Civic has between uh, 30,000 and 40,000 parts. An F-35 has around 300,000 parts. So let's say a subcontractor makes flux capacitors for cars, all right? And then they get a contract with the military and the military says, all right, we wanna buy 100,000 flux capacitors from you guys, uh, but you, you can't have any identification markings on it. Well, now these guys gotta start a different production line where they don't stamp it at the end with the serial number of the flux capacitor and you know, the other issue is that serial numbers are useful. You need serial numbers on pieces of equipment because serial numbers tell you whether a part needs to be changed out or when it needs to be serviced. You might have to inspect and remove a part every 100 hours of flight, and you need a way to identify and remove that part. Uh, parts can be recalled or upgraded. 
uh, you need to figure out whether this part is part of a bad lot. Even my, uh, my Coke can. My Coke can has a serial number on the bottom of it in case something went wrong at the factory and they need to recall the, that lot of Coke cans. So the short answer is that data plates uh, aren't removed because the adversary could easily figure out who fired the missile from the 3,000, 4,000, 400,000 other parts uh, that were on that weapon. Joseph asks, I'm aware that most schools teach English in Europe, but I was wondering, do the men and women assigned by their countries to NATO speak a certain language? NATO has two official languages, French and English. That's why you see NATO and OTAN. Why French? Well, the reason is that of the 12 original NATO members back in 1949, French was a major language in Belgium, Canada, and France. Now, now German is a pretty big language as well, but Germany really didn't join the alliance until 1955. So in Europe, about 65% of people can speak more than one language, and that language is often English. Uh, but at the time, it was English or French, just because that's what most people in Europe could speak. Today, most people who work at a NATO Joint Operations Center will speak in English or French, although, of course, there's always exceptions. Now, Bob asks, since Ukrainians were recently trained, it seems like they've been hanging out in reserve waiting for the big offensive. They were rushed through training and don't have any real experience, so aren't probably forgetting a lot of what they just learned. What can be done to keep them fresh so they're not liquidated right away when the UAF decides to go for it? Essentially, he's saying that it seems like the, these new crop of Ukrainian soldiers were trained very quickly, don't have a lot of combat experience, and now they're just waiting to get uh, sent to the front lines. Are they losing experience? Training is a perishable skill. Absolutely, training is a perishable skill. But it's not like you do basic training and then you don't do any more training. But you are constantly doing drills. If you're infantry, you might set up engineer tape in the layout of a house and just go through it clearing rooms. Uh, armor guys might just do drills on vehicle identification. Artillery guys will practice loading and laying the gun and saying the fire commands. It never ends. So believe me, the army keeps you pretty busy. It's not like they're, they're sitting playing poker like in the movies. They're, they're fine. Uh, they might not do a live fire exercise every day, but they are doing plenty of training and I can practically guarantee they're, they're going to bed tired. Now, finally, Brandon asks, do you think we may start to see universally highly advanced heavy equipment across NATO, standard main battle tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery pieces, with each member having classified alterations to subsystems, optics, armor packs, communications, dependent on an individual nation's fighting doctrine to increase manufacturing supply rates and streamline combat logistics for future conflicts as most data is collected from Western equipment that enters the battle space? I don't think so. Uh, NATO is important and interoperability is important, but I don't, I don't see each member standardizing on a standard APC, on a standard tank, because the needs of each military are so different due to their different countries. I know that Italy just won a contract to supply Niger's armed forces with equipment. If all of NATO's equipment was standardized, it wouldn't matter who they bought from. And weapon sales are a major industry. They provide good paying jobs, blue collar jobs, you know, the, the kind of people who are skilled tradesmen and countries want those people in jobs. So I don't really see a country giving up its arms industry and losing their manufacturing ability uh, to manufacture weapons just for the sake of standardization. Although standard, uh, standardization of ammunition is, is certainly important. And uh, that's it for this week. Take us away, Elon. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha ha ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. And I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shot. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no. It is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth is all the work. Yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunk of branding to fund Ryan Macbeth to increase your understanding. Oh yeah!